Hello everyone, uh, I'm Giovanni Armando, I'm a PhD student at the University of Pisa and INFN, and I'm today presenting a work that I've been working on with my supervisor and some other collaborators. As you can see, I've slightly changed the title because of uh, recent uh, updates on Xenon 1 ton excess, but I will talk about that. <laughs> and um, just a few heads up, unlike most, if not all, of the axions that we've talked about over the last few days, this is a visible QCD axion, meaning it's a much heavier one in the MEV range. And it does not constitute the dark matter candidate per se, but rather it's a mediator between a standard model and a dark sector. So I hope this can also be appealing to change things a bit. <laughs> So I'll begin with a bit of motivation as to why to construct a model like this, and then I will talk about the model, the constraints, how we link it to dark matter, and I will then wrap up. So having an axion, obviously it's a good thing because it solves the strong CP problem, and having a heavy axion, moreover, solves the petri queen quality problem, which is a theoretical problem that is quite important that I will talk about later. Then and the MEV is a really interesting region of the parameter space because there's a lot of physics going on. We have a lot of constraints and therefore we can make a lot of uh, testable predictions in that region. And moreover, as I was saying, visible QCD axions at the MEV scale that had been initially considered at the beginning of axion theory in the 80s that then got a bit neglected and people started focusing on the much lighter invisible axions. But recently, in the last few years, there's been also a bit of a revival in the theory side about QCD axions at the MEV scale. They're a good candidate to solve or accommodate the tension of the G minus two between the theory, whether it's the theory initiative value or the more recent lattice values and the experimental one. And as I said, it could have also been a mediator to a dark sector to explain specifically the xenon one ton excess, but then in general, a more generic dark matter sector as well. So let's begin. If we want to construct, let's say we have a generic axion-like particle at first, not necessarily a QCD axion. First thing you can do is write down a Lagrangian from a theoretical standpoint and couple it to the standard model fields uh, with fermions and photons if you want and other stuff like that. Um, Compared to the lighter axions, the phenomenology is completely different in this mass range. So you evade most of the astrophysical constraints and you focus on beam dump and collider uh, constraints mostly. And the first thing you can do is if you make a connection to the anomalous magnetic moments of the electron and of the muon, because we have very accurate experimental observations of that, we can use that to uh, infer the couplings that we need to the standard model leptons. And we did an analysis on that and we came up for our axion in a 10 MeV mass interval, more or less, we got to uh, an electron coupling of the order one over GV, because we have the breaking scale here. The mu on about 1% uh, of that, and that of the tau around a third of that of the electron. And the picture we get of the parameter space is this one. So we have electron coupling versus axion mass, and we're bound uh, from the above, we're excluded by collider constraints, the strongest of which is Chloe. Then we also get, as I was saying, beam dump constraints on the lifetime of the axions, and the strongest of those is NA64 here. And then if we want to, exp well, obviously those are also constraints, the anomalous magnetic moments of the muon and the electron cut out this big portion over here. And so we're left with a viable region, with it, which is this little white wedge here in the middle, which corresponds to electron couplings of order one over GV and axion masses in between eight to the 14 GV. So that's the parameter space we're dealing with. Next, we can now say this was valid for any generic axion-like particle. If you want to make a connection to the QCD axion, because obviously it's, it's good, it helps us to solve the solving CP problem, we know that QCD axions have this specific mass uh, decay rate relation, right? And you can know that if we have a breaking scale, a decay rate of the order of the GV, we get an axion mass, which is precisely the one that we need to land in this white parameter space over here. So that's a very fortunate coincidence, which makes us say, all right, let's not consider just an axion-like particle in general, but a specific UCD axion. Because on top of potentially solving the, uh, accommodating for the G minus two tension, this can also solve the strong CP problem and I mentioned before, also solve the Peche queen quality problem. So this one is a problem that is often overlooked, but I think theoretically it's very important. It has to do with the fact that invisible axions, so very light axions, have a very high decay rate here. And the problem is that 
um, the Petra Quinn symmetry that we invoked to solve a uh, strong CP problem is a global symmetry, right? And global symmetries, unlike gauge symmetries, they're not uh, intrinsic properties of theories. We don't have to, we don't need to have them valid at like any, any operate, like in, in an effective Lagrangian operators of any arbitrary dimension. In the standard model, they always arise as accidental symmetries. So for example, the baryon number conservation, which forbids proton decay, we get it at a normalizable level in the Lagrangian simply because we cannot write operators that violate that uh, symmetry. However, if we go to higher dimensional operators, we expect that to be the case. And similarly with the Petri-Quinn Petri symmetry, we expect that if we have uh, higher dimensional operators, we will eventually find terms that violate the Petri-Quinn symmetry. And the point is that to have, uh, to, to get a, a solution to the strong CP problem that is so precise compared to the bound on the theta parameter, which is like 10 to the minus 10, we would need a very, very accurate uh, quality of the symmetry in such a way. And if the scale is very high, um, the, the quality that we require is even higher because when we go to higher energy, the enhancement of higher dimensional operators will be bigger. And if instead we have uh, an effective petri queen breaking scale, which is low, this is not necessarily the case because at low energy, those operators are a lot more suppressed. And um, so, yeah, I think this is the main reason why uh, there's been uh, a big attention given to visible QCD axions in a heavier mass range in general. And uh, it's a very neat solution to this problem, if you ask me. Um, However, this doesn't come without its uh, downsides in the sense that um, QCD axions and in the MEV mass range have very strong experimental constraints. And that perhaps is the reason why people initially decided to shift to lighter axions. Um, but recently there's been this very nice paper that has come up a few years ago that basically went through all of the main constraints that axions have to undergo and um, essentially showed like the specific requirements that axions must fulfill to be viable in this mass range. And um, the, the, some of the, the main requirements that axion models must have in this range is that, for instance, they have to decay promptly into um, electrons because we get very, very strong constraints from the beam dump constraints. So we need a very large coupling of the axion to the electron. And this, in uh, the scenario that I showed, is kind of naturally fulfilled because to explain the G minus two, we get a very strong, uh, very large electron coupling already. Moreover, it must have a very suppressed coupling to the heavy quarks because we have very strong constraints from quarkonia decays, which would be enhanced in uh, non-leptonic channels if that weren't the case. And so any axion model in this range will, will have to have very small or zero petri queen charges of the heavy quark generations. And moreover, this for the heavy quarks and for the light quarks, we must have a pionphobic, so to say, axion. So it must have a very suppressed mixing with a neutral pion because otherwise, again, it would go uh, into constraints about, uh, about pion decays. And if you do an expansion in the Carroll Lagrangian, you can see, and you look at the axion pion mixing, you can see that you can obtain that by having the charge of the up that is twice the charge of the down. And uh, considering the, the charges that we had for the other leptons, a good way to solve that is to get charges in this, uh, in this range. So this is something that has to apply to all axions, QCD axions in the MEV scale. And, um, so we take that into account, and what we can do next is to try to make this axion a mediator to a dark sector. So essentially, we take the couplings that we already have, so the standard model leptons and the light quarks, and we add a coupling to a dark matter fermion, which we call chi. So this is the complete Lagrangian, the interaction Lagrangian, at least for, for the axion to the fermions. Um, by doing this, we will obviously get uh, nuclear recoil constraints on the dark matter side because we have couplings to the light quarks. But actually, you can show, again, by looking at the coupling, the mixing of the axion to the nucleons, that this is very similar to that to the pions. And so that if you have, have a pionphobic axion, you're also guaranteed to get relatively loose bounds from nuclear recoils, which I will show in the next slide. Then, as I was mentioning, xenon one ton, which has been uh, a big surprise, and that was the, the main driving uh, force that we had initially for this model. Um, the xenon one ton excess, it was shown that it could have been explained 
in terms of a GV scale dark matter fermion interacting uh, with a standard model through a pseudoscalar particle in the MEV range, which has been what has driven this, this work initially. But to do that, we needed to have the largest possible coupling of the axion to the dark matter fermion, which didn't violate perturbative unitarity, because if it was more, we would have to increase the axion-electron coupling, and uh, that would have put us in, constraint with, in, in conflict with the constraints that I was showing before from colliders. So the way was to saturate the limit of perturbative unitarity of the axion-dark matter uh, coupling. And uh, moreover, the fact that now we had all the couplings to the various fermions set, we could make predictions about the annihilation cross-section, the annihilation rate of uh, the dark matter fermions throughout the history of the universe by plugging them into the Boltzmann equation, which is what dark matter theorists do to, to observe what happens. And uh, what we got is that um, because of this large coupling, this cross-section, the annihilation cross-section mainly into electron was so big that by today we would get a relic abundance that was like 10 to the minus four of the observed dark matter abundance that we need to explain dark matter. And a paradigm that is invo invoked in these cases often to overcome these issues is to uh, posit that the dark matter sector is an, asymmetric sec is an asymmetric sector. So a bit like baryonic matter consists of more particles than antiparticles, you would say that the dark matter initially there was a, a, a bit of an asymmetry so that even though there is a very large cross-section, eventually the antiparticles run, we run out of antiparticles of dark matter, and so we are left with a, with a specific relic density, which is the one that we observe. So this is what we did when xenon one ton was a thing. Uh, as I was mentioning, we get constraints by direct detection experiments with nuclear recoil. So this is the uh, mass of the axion versus the mass of the dark matter fermion. And this whole gray region here is the one that is excluded by nuclear recoil. So it means that for an axion mass in the range that we are interested in, we need um, a dark matter mass which is lighter than uh, around 2 GV. And here I plotted also this blue region, which is the region that allowed to explain the xenon one ton excess so that the best fit would have been this blue region outside of the gray one, which simultaneously evaded nuclear recoil constraints, and at the same time was able to fit the xenon one ton excess. Now, and this is very recent uh, update, obviously with xenon one ton gone, we simply don't have that blue region anymore, and so there is a lot more freedom in the parameter space of the dark matter. Specifically, uh, we don't need to have that uh, very large coupling of dark matter to the axion, which we, we put because that's what we needed to explain xenon one ton. We don't need to saturate the perturbative unitarity limit. So we can think of having a, a smaller coupling between the axion and the dark matter, which then in turn implies a smaller annihilation cross-section uh, throughout the evolution, uh, throughout the history of the universe. And so we don't need to invoke asymmetric dark matter necessarily. We can just think of having the thermal WIMP paradigm, which is perhaps the most, uh, um, the most standard one. So where you have uh, a dark matter particle and antiparticles annihilating, and then at some point, uh, because of the expansion rate of the universe, the particles can't find each other anymore, and it's, we, we obtain what we call freeze out. So we get the standard uh, abundance that then becomes fixed. And uh, so, yeah, this is pretty much uh, the model that we've been working on. And, and uh, so I will quickly wrap up what I said. Um, so I, sh I said that I showed that a QCD axion with a, a mass in the MEV range, which is also known as a visible axion, is viable despite having very strong experimental constraints. And it's particularly appealing because on top of the strong CP problem, it allows us to solve potentially the G minus two of the muon, and moreover, the Peche queen quality problem related to the um, high breaking scale of the Peche quin symmetry. Then, uh, with this model, with initially generic couplings, we can constrain the couplings to the leptons uh, using the experimental observation of the anomalous magnetic moments, both of the electron and the muon, and the one to quarks uh, from the quarkonia decay, which imposes small or zero couplings to the large quarks, and pyomphobia, which uh, um, uh, fixes the couplings to the light quarks. Then I showed how the xenon one ton excess could have been explained by extending this, the dark matter couplings to a coupling with a dark matter fermion under an asymmetric paradigm because the, uh, the coupling was very big. Uh, 
And finally, I briefly mentioned how with the excess gone, we can instead consider the generic uh, thermorelic WIMP instead and don't have to consider the, the asymmetric uh, nature anymore. And moreover, I'll just quickly uh, mention that we're also trying to construct a, a UV construction of this, uh, a UV completion of this theory so that uh, basically we get the right couplings of the axion in the, in the infrared. And because they are, these are flavor non-universal, this is... Uh, uh, pretty tricky from an ultraviolet completion model. And um, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, okay, so questions? Uh... Yeah, there's one there. So, when you uh, talk about G minus two of the muon, is it the 4.2 sigma deviation you are talking about? So, the one that we fit here, yes, this was based on the 4.2 sigma. If instead we want to consider the more recent uh, results with the lattice, yeah. you can also do that. We'll simply, that will simply kind of shift this constraint to the bottom right, so we will get a more open, uh, viable parameter space. So it would be more open. Okay. Yeah. Okay, okay. It will become looser, yeah. Okay. Thank you, yeah. Any other questions? Uh, I had a quick question about uh, the U, uh, where you say UV completion. What, what, uh, can you elaborate a little more on that? Sure. So, uh, in, uh, when you construct a, a quantum field theory, so a model for, uh, for a, a particle theory, the, the standard model, for example, as we know it, it has operators of, of dimension four, which is uh, essentially like the space-time dimension. So uh, we, we expect that to be valid at arbitrary uh, energy scales. Whereas if we have things like these operators here, where we have um, this we call mass dimension five operator, because this is dimension one, this is dimension one, and this is dimension three in total, to obtain a, an overall dimension four, which is what we need to evaluate the integral, we must divide this by an effective energy range. And essentially we expect that when we go, when we reach, when we increase the energy and get up to that specific energy, the theory is not uh, valid anymore at that range. And above that energy, we need that, what we call an ultraviolet completion. So uh, a more complete theory that when we come down in energy, we'll eventually yield uh, below the energy of reference here will yield this uh, theory here. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any uh, more questions, or the is the coffee kind of uh, okay? Well, let's uh, let's thank all the speakers of the, this morning session.